Okay, welcome everyone to another episode of the Store Nova Conversations. Uh, these conversations that we've been having um, occasionally since the beginning of the pandemic about stoicism and which they'll they'll probably continue afterwards if there's going to be an afterwards. I mean, we'll see. Uh, my name is Massimo Bellucci. I'm a professor of philosophy at the City College of New York. Uh, and here's how this is uh, going to work. First of all, let me start with a, um, an announcement. The next episode of the Store Nova Conversations will be actually Sunday, Jan uh, July 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern time, which by the way, might become actually our more or less regular slot. We've been you know, playing around with different time uh, slots and days. But so Sunday, July the 19th at 1 p.m. The topic will be Stoic Camp and Stoicism in Prison. And the reason for this bizarre combination of topics is that my uh, guest will be University of Wisconsin professor Rob Coulter, who is the guy that actually studied the very first uh, Stoic camp in Wyoming, and also actively teaches Stoicism in prison. So, so that would be interesting. To register for that event, you go to meetup.com and look for Stoa Nova. And if you wish to watch past episodes, of course, of these conversations, you go to YouTube and search for the channel under my name. Now, getting to today's topic, uh, it's a rather unusual one, Stoic comedy, which may sound like an oxymoron, but we'll figure out in a few minutes. Uh, my guest today is uh, Michael Connell. Michael is a comedian, juggler, corporate speaker, and on his better days, he says, a bit of a thinker. As a comedian, he gets a twisted sense of satisfaction out of making boring topics funny. Uh, so I guess he's going to be really at home with Stoicism. Uh, he's gotten laughs explaining ancient Greek philosophy, current attitudes toward poverty and affluence, the futuristic cryptocurrency. Watch out for his next show, uh, which mixes jokes about meta learning and neuroplasticity. Oh, that's going to be funny. With circus tricks, you should trust him. It is really, really funny. Okay, welcome, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for having me on the show. Uh, what an intro. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I, like the, and, I like the start. You're like, we'll have more of these discussions if there's still a future to have. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the for a minute, the right? goal will, be, will be here on Sunday. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, before we get even to stories, I, I, I've always been curious, as I think a lot of people, about um, comedians. And so how did you get into comedy? This is not the kind of thing that your mom probably wanted you to get into, was it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, probably not. My, my mom is actually very integral to me getting into comedy. When I was a kid, um, I don't know. I always, I, I always wanted to be funny. I always liked entertaining people, telling stories, telling jokes. I suppose, you know, like the Stoics talk about nature, I guess has always been in my nature. So, right. <laughs> be funny in some way as a, as a as a kid i grew up in the country and i didn't you know there was no i didn't see stand up i didn't know of it as an art form and in you know school when i was a little kid i used to tell stories to people and i was always in the school play and stuff for a while i thought i was going to be an actor because mm -hmm. I, I was good at acting but then i went to acting like drama camp and there were kids who could like cry on command. And I was like, oh, that's, that's not me. <laughs> I just like pretending to be a chicken and running around in the drama room. Um, and then, yeah, my mum, uh, when I was about 15, 16, she took me to see a show called Class Comedians, Class Clowns, mm. sorry, at, at the uh, Melbourne Comedy Festival. And it was all these, uh, it was a talent contest for high school students doing stand up. And I just saw stand up for the first time. I was like, this is it. This is exactly the thing I've wanted to do. It clicked. I'm probably like, oh, why didn't I take him, you know, to the doctors? <laughs> 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 Visit a lawyer's office and set him on a good path. But, you know, I was like, you know, this is the thing I've been trying to describe. Like, if you'd asked me as a kid, what do you want to do? I'd be like, I want to be a, someone who stands on stage and tells funny stories. It's kind of like I was growing up in the Sahara and being like, I want to be a person who catches animals out of a large body of water. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you get started with it? I mean, how, how do you actually get into it? Uh, well, I, uh, from seeing that competition as a, 
audience member, I entered the following year. So mm -hmm. in high school, I did like three, four gigs. It was very hard because, you know, you're underage. Most comedies held in right. pubs and clubs. So you're not allowed in. Um, but they, yeah, they ran a young high school comedians competition called Class Clowns. I entered, uh, got runner up in the grand final and yeah, stuck with it ever since. Basically, then I started, when I started going to university at like 1920, pretty much I was, yeah, went at it and kept doing it ever since. Nice. Well, very nice. I'm glad, I'm glad you did because I watched several of your videos and they really are funny. Um, so now about stoicism. So how did you get into stoicism in the first place? Um, yeah, that's pretty interesting. I think it was Tim Ferriss. Okay. Um, yeah, he's a, drag, a, a getaway drug for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of people say that. People say it's either Tim Ferriss or Ryan Holiday. Right. Or, or uh, pre that, it was um, William Irving's book. Um, right. And kind of that was the path for me. I listened to Tim Ferriss's, I don't think it even, I think it was even before the podcast. I think he wrote a large blog post about Seneca's um, on the shortness of life. And from that, I was like, this is fascinating. I'm really interested. And then I went and read, um, you know, a guide to the good life. Yeah. And, and yeah, it all came from that. Yeah. Guide to the good life was my first book on modern stoicism as well. I mean, I've, I've, I had read Marcus Aurelius meditations when I was in college but that was a long time ago. And, and besides, I really didn't read it in the context of a philosophy of life. I just read it because it was an interesting book. And, and when I was in, back in high school, I uh, actually translated Seneca uh, because I took Latin. Uh, but again, it, I never put the two, two things together. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> never sunk in. You're like, oh, this is an interesting... Right, yeah, you know. And then it took, it took many more years and a lot more experience. So finally said, well, wait a minute, there is something here. Okay, and then now the obvious question. How did you put the two things together? The stoicism and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and the comedy. The comedy. Um, well, I suppose I started applying... All my comedy comes from my life. So basically, whatever I'm living, I start writing about that. Uh, my wife gets kind of annoyed at this. Um, <laughs> like, I bet. <laughs> like you want to do the fun stuff, and you don't want to do the, you know, the 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 hard stuff. Um, like right now, like I said, my last. You mentioned in the intro, the last uh, special I put together is about juggling, and I've been getting into juggling. That's kind of my process. I, I get a hobby. I do the hobby intensely. Then I write a show about that hobby then i sell tickets to the show i basically get paid for the hobby or the interest so that's how it works with stoicism um i you know i was reading all the books listening to all the podcasts i'm thinking this is really interesting um there's always as a comedian you know you can do the same sort of comedy about the same sort of topics that everyone else does hey are men and women different you know cats and dogs are different what's the deal right. with airlines peanuts you know that sort of stuff so you're always looking for a point of difference and i'm like this is fascinating material also it's very unlike a lot of philosophy it's very relevant to people it's a practical philosophy um and it's still even though it's thousands of years old it's still stuff you can apply you know human you know society changes but you know human nature doesn't really change that's exactly how I explain it to, to people when, when, when uh, I get into interviews where, where somebody asks me, you know, why would, would uh, a philosophy that is you know, more than two millennia old uh, be relevant today? I say, well, because the world is very different, but human beings are pretty much the same. We, we, we are the same you know, stuff. We, we uh, want the same things. We uh, don't want the same things. We give, you know, and, and that's, that hasn't changed. I mean, one of my favorite bits is uh, in Seneca, uh, one of these letters to Lucilius, where at some point he complains about all the, 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 the sounds that, that are coming from the street and he can't, he's distracted, he can't write, right? So yeah, I live in New York City. I can, I can, I can, I can sympathize with that kind of sentiment. It's just the same thing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And all this sort of, 
the, the readings were sort of helping me in my life. And I was like, I can talk about this stuff. It's interesting. And people are going to relate to it. It's, it was a pretty easy choice. And that was my first, my, my next question. That is, so I assume that stories, you actually are you know, taking the stoic uh, lessons into putting it into practice in your own life. So how is that helpful to you? How has been, can, can you give an example or two of, of how that has actually been helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the, uh, the pandemic uh, <laughs> has, has given us all a bit of uh, uh, stoic training. Um, it's, a, it's a great example of things you can't control. Um, you know, also be thankful, you know, for what you have. Uh, it's a good training in frugality as well. Um, yeah, I, I, especially being a, a performer, being a comedian, it's a very, it's a hard, it's a hard life and it's very, uh, unpredictable and can be quite difficult at times and a lot of it comes down to sort of having good mental processes to handle all this chaos and unpredictability in your life yep. and yeah focusing on things I can control circles of concern all these sort of approaches speaking of which Speaking of things that you can't control, so you, in one of your videos, you have an interesting take on the dichotomy of control. You want to you wanna explain to our viewers <laughs> how do you think about the dichotomy of control as a comedian? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I like to talk about the, I use the example of catching trains in Melbourne. So when I was writing that routine, I was living in Melbourne and people always get upset about the trains not arriving on time and then they make announcements and they apologize for the trains not being there. I think they should make better announcements be like, you know, uh, in India, trains come every two days and people be like, Oh, this is only an hour late. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Thank it's God. the perspective that you have on what's happening yep. rather than what's actually happening. That's right. Yeah, I, it's one of those things that actually help uh, stories may has helped me quite a bit is to be more patient about these sort of situations. Like, you know, a flight canceled, for instance, or something like that. It's like, okay, well, the flight is being canceled. Fine. Uh, fortunately for me, I have books with me and uh, I can read, I can write, I can do all sorts of stuff. Okay. And then we'll see what happens next. As opposed, you know, what is the point of really getting upset and mad at the, at the agent who doesn't, can't do anything about it anyway? In this, in the pandemic, it was, you know, it was very, uh, it was pretty full on. I got basically a year's work cancelled in <laughs> two weeks. So that was fantastic. But, you know, obstacle is the way I had to sit down and go, what am I doing? What is the opportunity in this misfortune? And I go, hmm. I guess I have a lot more time to write material now. So over the last, yeah, three months, I've been trying, it's hard. I've got a, uh, I've got a 16 month old daughter who's teething. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's hard. So that's, but I'm trying to write and you know, she cries and stuff and I'm like, all right, this is also teaching me patience. So, <laughs> but that's I right. get up in the morning and you know, while she's having a bottle, I'll punch out a few ideas. And I've actually, surprise myself how much I've got written. Um, haven't been able to test it yet. So who knows right. what it will be like. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as, as comedy gigs start coming back, um, I'll, I've got one tonight. It's going to be pretty interesting. We were just talking before the start of the uh, interview. Uh, it's a very strange gig. It's at a pancake kitchen in Adelaide. <laughs> people or social distancing but uh, i'll try out the material and who knows even if it doesn't even if it doesn't all work which i'm sure some of it won't some of it will and you know it's better than of being you know sitting around for the last three months going oh no exactly i'm not the perfect stoic i'm not going to pretend that i am if you ask my wife she will tell you i did my fair share of oh no <laughs> but, oh that that makes the two of us my friend but but it, you know <laughs> th th this very conversation we're having is another example of what you're talking about i started these things 
uh, after the pandemic uh, started because in, before these were actually meetings that was having at the Society for Ethical Culture in New York City with, you know, in live, you know, in, in person and all that sort of stuff. And that was not possible all of a sudden. And so I said, oh, so what am I gonna do? Oh, everybody's Zooming all over the place. So let me use Zoom for something uh, that might actually reach, you know, people. And the result of it, of course, is that the audience is much larger. I can talk to you. Yeah, I could have never gotten you to New York uh, to just have a chat for, for an evening, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and so it's, it's kind of working on, in, okay. It's, uh, it's not, not the same thing. It's a different thing. As you said, it, the, the obstacle uh, becomes the way, which is a paraphrase of, of Marcus Aurelius. Now, in another one of your videos, you explained that there is nothing truly good or bad, only perceptions. How does that go? <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's great as a comedian because you, you it instantly cuts off all reviewers or critics <laughs> they're like this is right. a terrible comedy show you're like in your opinion <laughs> <laughs> if you choose to see it as such then that is correct uh, <laughs> but yeah uh yeah, it, it exactly it, it's again like we were talking just then looking at whatever comes your way and going what is the advantage of this if you instantly make a judgment and say this pandemic is terrible it is arguably pretty bad but you but if you make that judgment you you close off any opportunity to get anything from it if you go hey look there's a lot of you know dispreferred uh aspects of this situation, but then there might be some good in it as well. You can find those things. You can find the opportunity. You can turn it to your advantage. Um, yeah, so. and people often say, uh, you know, well, that's just a mind trick, uh, you know, and yeah, it is, but guess what? The way we, we navigate life is a mind trick because it's, it's not like the way we normally think about things is the way to think about stuff. It's, we, we always choose a particular framework, a particular way of looking at things. Yeah, and if you can if you can frame things in a different way and be more effective at dealing with those things, perhaps it is a mind trick. But if you get results, right, yes. <laughs> it's fine. I mean, um, I mean just yeah. being upset and saying these things are terrible and they are terrible and let's all agree and end of discussion. If that achieves things for you, then by all means go yep. for that <laughs> exactly whatever whatever works right it works now in in one of my favorite videos that you've you've done about stoicism you use the game uh past the parcel to explain what the stoic means by living according to nature can can you tell us about it <laughs> yeah well i uh i i use the analogy about the past the parcel because uh a lot of people you know they i th i think they don't get used to not getting what they want all the time too much how, how does the game go because i actually was not familiar with it um, um really? and growing up I... in italy yeah yeah and it's not an italian game i guess <laughs> <laughs> well as a kid you're, you you wrap a big parcel you, usually it's like one toy at the end you wrap it wrap it wrap it wrap it and maybe nowadays they add more little presents throughout it but when i was a kid you'd pass the parcel around each kid takes out takes a layer of wrapping off at the end you get a little prize one kid gets the prize. <laughs> nowadays i think they play it so that every kid gets the prize of which course is a terrible lesson i was i was arguing in in the stand-up routine that uh we should make it even a better lesson we should have no prize at the end we should just uh, pass it around every kid unwraps <laughs> a, a layer it gets absolutely nothing at the end we've all learned a valuable lesson get used to disappointment <laughs> <laughs> learn how to handle not getting what you want that's right <laughs> exactly right. I mean, the, it's, it know? is a serious point right i mean it, it one of the things that struck me um about american society especially recently you know i moved in this country like almost three decades ago at this point but i did grow up in, in, in italy with a fairly different culture as you might imagine and one of the things that struck me as interesting about the united states is this notion this, this eternal optimist and also to some extent, uh, which is one of the good things I suppose about Americans, but at the same time, it also comes with a little bit of a sense of entitlement that of course things are gonna work, work out for the best. Of course, you, you know, you, we tell our kids, you can be all you want to be. It's like, 
No, you can't. Uh, th there's lots of things you won't be able to do because there are constraints uh, that mm. society, life, you know, everything imposes on you. So no, you're not going to be able to do whatever you want, and you've got to be used to it. Even if, even if it's not society or external factors limiting what you can do, just by the fact that you are one person and you can be in more than one place, your, your wants and desires are unlimited, but your ability to fulfill those desires are limited by time and space. So, exactly. You know, exactly. I, you know, I always want to be everything. I, I want to be a comedian and I try to learn music and, oh, I don't know, I'd, I'd do everything if I could, but there's only one of me. You've got to make a choice and pick. That's right. And then that is one of the, the stoic lessons is about, in a sense, what we will call today time management, right? So, so Seneca wrote an entire book on the shortness of life, uh, where he says, you know, be careful, because actually, as it turns out, the, the most precious thing you have is not money, is not property, is not nothing like that. It's time. Mm. Um, because it's finite there's you only have a certain amount you don't know how long you're gonna have you know statistically you can have expectations about oh i'm gonna live until my i'm, I'm in my 80s well maybe or you can die tomorrow because you know of an accident or, or a disease there's, there's no telling so the time is limited you don't know how much you have so what the hell are you doing wasting it uh you know not not doing things that you actually like enjoy that are meaningful and so on and so forth and the, the notion uh, of making choices about, you know, you can't do everything. So, okay, what is it that I'm good at and that I enjoy and that I find meaningful? And that's the way you're going to go. In your case, comedy. Um, you know, it's, that's, that's the, that is the lesson it's, as opposed to, oh, well, I have infinite possibilities. You really don't. It's, 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 it's a much more constrained situation than that. Um, in another one of your videos, you talk about the premeditation of evil and what you call about uh, you, you call the the power of negative thinking how, how, do, how do you practice the, the premeditation of evil in that context <laughs> well again I, I bring it back to uh i bring it back to public transport i i gotta be, give a big shout out to melbourne's public transport system for writing <laughs> a lot of my material but uh, people always you know people always get on the train and they're like this is terrible you know it, the train's late, it smells of urine, um, and they put signs up there like, oh, we're trying doing our best to get the trains run on time, we're doing our best to keep the trains clean. They should just put up signs saying, every train, it's going to be an hour late, it's going to smell like rotting meat. You'd get on the train, you'd be like, this is better than I expected. This is, <laughs> this is not bad. <laughs> this is, they made it out to be very horrible. All right? I, think that's a, I think that's a good way to approach things if you like it can be people say oh look for the be an optimist look look at the look for the best and yeah there's there's advantages to being an optimist and i think you should look for the good in things but you don't want to be naive and just uh, sort of blank out all the possibilities if you think about how bad things can go usually they don't go that bad and then you'll be a lot happier as, as a result um uh i'm drawing a blank on the guy behind cbt um, oh uh, albert, uh, albert ellis, ellis yes mm -hmm. albert ellis. and he his 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 argument was things can always be worse um he's like you know no matter what's happening things can be worse you could be dead and people are like oh well nothing worse than that and he was like well you know could be worse than that. You could be dead, and your family could be dead. And then beyond that, you could be dead. Your family could be dead. I think. I think his ultimate thing was the utter destruction of the entire universe. But you know, so anything short of that, it's good. You know, it, yeah, you're you're winning. <laughs> That's right. I mean, it's all about expectations. And again, that's another example of a stoic mind trick. I I, I agree that. Um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be optimistic in the sense of trying to look for good for for new paths, new new ways to do things, uh, depending on the circumstances. That's I think a very reasonable kind of optimism. But the kind of optimism that is like, oh, things are going to go great, and it's, you have very high expectations. Well, those are very easy to disappoint because reality usually doesn't match very high expectations. On the other hand, if you if you get them a few notches down, then your reality might actually be able to beat the expectations, and that would be great. Mm. 
Reality tends to come in, in the middle, doesn't it? Like if yeah, you have yeah, crazy low. low expectations, <laughs> you're not going to meet it. But crazy low, you're probably not going to meet them either. So <laughs> go crazy low, you'll you'll hit about here and you'll be like, exactly. Oh. Exactly. Um, now, in another video, you also talk about being addicted to luxury, which is another stoic uh, theme. So, how how would you, how would we know and, and and how do we get out of this addiction of luxury for luxury? Well, I th I think you got to test everything uh, fairly regularly. Um, so, if ever if ever you're finding yourself being like, hmm, I quite I quite like this, or I, I really enjoy that, switch it up. See if you can do without it. Um, last month I decided I was going to give up coffee because I, I found myself getting up every morning, especially with the baby and drinking coffee. And then I'd have like a coffee later on in the morning and I had a coffee. I was drinking like three coffees a day. And then I was like, how did I get to this point? And I was like, it's because, you know, I, I enjoy the coffee, but what I really enjoy is sitting down, having a moment, drinking this warm drink, you know? So I was like, can I, let's put it to the test. Let's see, do I need the coffee? Am I hooked? Um, so I, yeah, I gave it a month and I was surprised that I, I did bet. I thought I was gonna, it was gonna be really hard to mm -hmm. quit it because I thought I was gonna be addicted to the caffeine, but I found after a week I was, fine with it and after a month i didn't even miss it and so i'm now I'm like great now i have gone back i am drinking coffee again but it's always good <laughs> to test yourself and see do i need this is this something that i'm stuck on um because you want to be in control you don't want right. to be controlled by these things mm -hmm. that you need you think, oh, i have to have a car or i have to have coffee or i have to have a a, a laptop or a phone test test these assumptions and then it gives you many more options in life yeah it turns out there is actually very good evidence from modern psychology that that's a good way to go about sort of resetting what psychology is called the hedonic treadmill this notion that you know you you get the new car or the new iphone or the new whatever and you're very excited for you know a few hours or a few days or a few weeks and then after that it's like, ah, okay it's just an iphone it's just a car or whatever and then you yeah. need something else right and of course, that's how our, how our consumerist society actually works because you know, the advertisers convince you that of course, you're gonna be happy if you get another card or another item. Um, but the, the notion is that uh, the, the way to reset the, the uh, hedonic treadmill is exactly what Seneca uh, was talking about. That is do without it for a while. It's, you, you'll discover that A, you can, you can, you can actually do it without it. It's like, it's okay, it's fine. And B, when you get back to it, you actually enjoy it even better. Mm. because like oh well, so much so much of our modern life we uh we think oh we have to have this or we have to have that um you know it'd be crazy to live in a house without air conditioning we've just had air conditioning installed here and i i think about that i think how could i get through summer without air conditioning and then i think you know pre like what 1995 everyone in the entire history of the world has lived <laughs> without air conditioning <laughs> it's, yeah. It is possible. <laughs> it is absolutely possible. Exactly. Uh, let me remind our uh, viewers that we're going to start with the Q and A in a few minutes. So if you want to get yourself your little uh, virtual hand up, uh, then I'll call on you. Um, Michael, you know that thinking about death makes you feel alive. How does that work? Well, again, it's uh, sort of this premeditation of evil. Think about like what, like what Albert Ellis was saying, what's the worst that could happen? And then, you know, if you're getting better than that, you're on a win. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I've, I've recently become a parent, as I mentioned, uh, you know, my yeah. daughter's 16 months old. And uh, I don't know, it, it changes your approach to being a parent. I think I'm a bit older. I've also read a lot of this stoic philosophy and sometimes you see parents in, uh, I'm not having a go at parents. Parenting is a super hard job, but you see them in, in the, you know, in the hospital or whatever, they're reading through all the parenting books and they're getting obsessed. And then I'm kind of like, you know, she's alive. She's happy. <laughs> <laughs> We're winning. You know, me and my wife are constantly looking at each other like, 
she's dressed, she's happy right. and smiling, the baby's still alive at the end of the day, we're high-fiving each other, yes. You know, <laughs> I, I think about, you know, people, people are like, sometimes friends are like, have you, have you read this, are you across that? I'm like, look, people have been having babies since there's been people, you know, we've been having, this is where people come from, you know, and historically, like this is the safest time ever in the history of the world, you know, like people had kids during the Black Death, uh, you know, in caveman time. There's not a bear in the house. <laughs> right, right. Like, yeah, I, I mean, um, you know, Mar Marcus Aurelius, uh, who was, of course, remember, let's remember, the emperor, literally that means the most powerful person in, you know, in the entire Mediterranean area, he was, uh, he had the best physician at the time, Galen, and nevertheless, he lost two thirds of his children. Uh, you know, they didn't make it to adulthood. Unfortunately, one of those that did was uh, Commodus, and that was bad for the Roman Empire. Uh, but, you know, that gives you kind of a perspective. It's like we're talking about at the time, uh, having a child dying uh, before reaching adulthood was normal. This, this was the expectation. This was like, okay, that's why I need to, had to have 14 or 15 kids because. You know, only four or five of them are going to make it. Why the numbers? It was it. Uh, was it Epic Tetis who said you should kiss your wife and child yeah. good night and, and and imagine them being dead in the morning? That's um, right. <laughs> I I do think about it. I don't say it to them when I <laughs> put them to yeah. bed. Probably not a good idea. A little star, but uh, it is it is a good thing to think about, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people take that that bit in uh, in the Enchiridion uh, as uh, like an example of just how atrocious and you know awful Stoic philosophy is. But they they then tend to forget a couple of things. First of all, in the time of Epictetus, this was actually something that could really happen very easily. Right. And so he was definitely preparing himself for something that was a normal occurrence. And that thankfully, as you say, we live in, in times where that actually is fairly rare, but it can still happen. And, and the point of that exercise, uh, you know, reminding yourself that uh, your loved ones are mortal and they're going to eventually they're going to go, um, is not to indulge in some, some kind of sort of, sort of you know, uh, pleasure of, of the thought of death or something like that. It's just to remind you that that's why you need to pay attention to them right here, right now, while they are alive and, and, and kicking, right? You, you should enjoy your daughter right now because that time is going to pass. You should mm -hmm. enjoy your wife right now because that time is going is to pass. Epictetus puts it very nicely in the discourses when he says that we shouldn't be, um, it's, it is foolish to wish for figs in winter, right? So because figs are not in fly, flowering winter, you're not going to get the, win the, the winter figs. So if you want them in winter, you're a fool. Now, guess what, however, during the summer, you should probably eat f figs if that's what you like, because you know, that is the season. Uh, so you should pay attention to when things are and, and when people are, are around. Now, we talked about a number of Stoic concepts, but I wanted to, I'm kind of curious to, to see if there is one idea that you got from Stoicism that is your favorite, your, your the one they say, oh yeah, that's, that's the one that actually does it for me. Well, I'm always using, uh, you know, the obstacle is the way sort of idea, looking at what is the situation? How can I turn this to advantage? What has life brought me? How can I turn lemons into lemonade? Um, what I'm really thinking about now during this pandemic is Seneca's quote, I hope I'm going to quote it right, uh, is that frugality can make a poor man rich. Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to write this as a routine, so I don't know how I'm going to go, but... Um, I'm guessing that's... as a comedian, you've, you've had quite a bit of frugality to deal with. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Comedy is a very sort of up and down, sort of one month you'll be making, you know, right. $20,000. The next month you'll be making 20 bucks. So it's a very sort of good training in frugality. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think this is a, this is, would be a good thing to talk about. And I'd love to make a routine about approaches to frugality because people see it as, 
deprivation as like, oh, I, I can't spend money. I can't go crazy. They're, they're missing out on fun. But I, from my experience, I've sort of gone from having to be frugal. I've learned ways to be able to go, oh, um, how can I get the most out of life while spending the least amount of money? Because money is time, right? People always say that time is money. Right. We were talking again about what Seneca talked about in the shortness of life. If you're spending your money, you're spending, you're giving your time away and you want to be very careful about how you do that because, you know, it's a limited supply. It is um, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm fascinated by this sort of stuff. Uh, uh, I'm trying to make it more funny, think of good ways to do it. I think I just saw someone mention in the comments, flash, I'm not great with the tech, so, but I think it flashed across the screen, Mr. Money Mustache. I'm a huge Mr. Money Mustache fan. <laughs> and I know he's a fan of them as well. Um, so I think there's a huge overlap in there. Sounds good. All right, last question before we go open to the Q&A, which is, so if you had a time machine, all right, and you could go back to, you know, when the Stoics actually started, which, which, which Stoic would you like to encounter? And, 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 and what would you ask him? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, I'd be pretty interested. I, I change on this all the time. I, I, I love the Enchiridion. So I, I used to think Epictetus would be great to meet. Um, Marcus Aurelius would be pretty interesting. As well. At the moment, I'm because I'm reading more Seneca, I would kind of like to meet Seneca. I'm also kind of fascinated because he was a playwright as well. I would yes. love to see some of his plays. I kind of like, he was in showbiz. I was in, I'm in showbiz. Who would get along, you know? What was it? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I would love to talk to Seneca. And the first question I would ask him is, what the hell is wrong with you and Nero kind of thing? You know, it's, it's, what, what was going on there? <laughs> Didn't get much across there. I mean... Yeah, you know. I mean, was a miscommunication. You're a, you're, a, you're a teacher though, Massimo. I'm sure you've had some students go off the rails. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're not proud of every one of your pupils? Well, you know, when, when I talk about um, Epictetus, and I, and I have to mention, of course, that he never actually wrote anything down, unlike Seneca, that all we have from Epictetus, the discourses in the Enchiridion, are actually <clears throat> the result of the writing of one of his students, Aaron of, uh, of, uh, Arian of Nicomedia. And then I say, um, I would be really worried if everything that I leave to the next generation is actually the notes of one of my students, because that, that could be really dangerous. <laughs> I don't know what the heck is going to come across uh, that, that way. Hopefully, Arian got it, got it right. <laughs> All right. So in terms of questions, we have Joseph first. Um, and Joseph, go ahead. Um, thank you both for joining us. I very much appreciate it. Thank you, Massimo and Michael. Uh, you had mentioned some of that your comedy emanates from your situation that you're living in the, in the current moment. How do you balance being sensitive to a particular situation with making light of it and making good humor? So where you're considerate of people's, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, circumstances is the only word I could think of. So thank you. No, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, well, I basically the way my comedy works is it's about me. Um, so when I'm on stage, I'm t talking about my life or what's going on with me. And I think people uh, sort of relate to that. They understand that I'm not on stage having a go at anyone in the crowd. And even if I am a bit that way, and I do get a bit that way in the, in my stoic special where I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm being a bit like Epictetus, you blockheads think about things. I'm also kind of getting angry at myself because I'm making those mistakes and I am doing these, having these, 
uh, silly thoughts. So I'm kind of giving myself a slap up the head, side of the head as much as anyone else. And I think people appreciate that and that makes a, a more accessible way to explain these ideas. Without but when you bring in uh, examples from your family life, for instance, like you, were, you mentioned earlier, yeah, like your, your wife is like, eh, okay, do you actually have to go there? How, how do you balance that, that part? Uh, well, <laughs> my, my, my wife is uh, a bit of my voice of reason. A lot, of, a lot of the time so like in life but also a lot of in my comedy so I'll use her as sort of an outside observer on how silly I'm being um usually that's the joke because that's what I find funny um I don't know I've always yep. found that. um she always points out that I think it's hilarious when she goes you know you're an idiot right and I'm like yeah, why? And then we'll have a 15 minute conversation. He's like, you see? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. That is. <laughs> like, well, that's, uh, you know, that's the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning that of wisdom. Beginning you know, of wisdom. You're realizing that there is limitations there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. We got um, next question is by, by from C. Moreau. And uh, people, I just remind you that if you want to ask a question, you need to raise your, your virtual hand, okay? Yeah, go for it. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks, Michael, for uh, being a guest on So Nova Massimo for hosting. Um, Michael, I was curious about, uh, you've talked a lot about how humor can function as a delivery method for kind of uh, one thing that came up was turning obstacles and opportunities. Another thing was uh, frugality and richness. I'm wondering how humor also maybe function, functions as an action um, in itself, so not necessarily something to um, comment on uh, a stoic concept, but as a way of, of kind of stoic living in itself. Um, and just for some context that I was thinking of is um, Epictetus's response to an insult of, well, if they knew everything about me, then um, they'd have a lot more to say. And um, I was just wondering if you, know, you see parallels with that or uh, any other comments you have. Thank you. Jim. Yeah, absolutely. I sometimes to get a bit, um, I don't know, pretentious, I, I like to think of comedy as a way of life or a bit of a philosophy. Um, I find a lot of parallels with comedy and stoicism in that a lot of comedians, you know, bad things will happen and be happening to them and they'll be like, this is great for material. In six months, I'm going to be <laughs> laughing about this. I'll be writing a great routine, you know. Um, and I also think it's a it's a it's a very good thing um, to be able to laugh at yourself. Um, a lot, the the Stoics always talk about, you know, if you it, the path to wisdom is is very hard from the start. You're going to be having other people considering you a fool, so. This is the price of getting smarter is, is that Socratic notion of knowing that you know nothing and <laughs> being able to accept, hey, I'm a bit of a stupid person sometimes. Um, I'm opening myself up to new experiences. And if you're, if you're willing to have a laugh at yourself, you can, you can do anything. If you're too you know, uptight and keep in being serious and keeping a straight, maintaining your facade, then you'll, you'll never go out of your comfort zone. You'll never take a chance and you'll never learn anything. Yeah, when you talk about uh, laughing as a, or seeing humor in things as a philosophy of life, uh, two of the pre-Socratic philosophers come, come to mind, Heraclitus, who was a big influence on the Stoics, and Democritus, who was a big influence on the Epicureans. And they, in, uh, if you check out, um, there is a number of uh, Renaissance paintings where they're actually painting next to each other, painting next to each other, and the reason for that is because in the, in antiquity they were respectively known as the crying philosopher and the laughing philosopher, and and meaning that that uh, Heraclitus thought that the human condition is such a disaster that the only thing to do is just to cry in desperation. The must the uh, uh, saw this the exact same thing. Um, but Ispa was like, okay, that's, that's, that's really laughable. This is, this is really something funny. And so um, it's a, to me, it's a very interesting because I, I can see both points of view. I can see why, you know, somebody would despair about, at the human condition and somebody else would say, you know what, 
let's just laugh about it. It's it's actually a good defense against the against the the, the cosmos to be able to laugh about it. I think that was uh, Mel Brooks who said something along those lines. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, uh, didn't Seneca say that? Oh, I'm going to butcher the quote, but if it's uh, if there's one thing worth crying about, everything's worth crying about. Something on those lines. That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I guess he was more in, into uh, Democritus than than <laughs> Um Okay. Next we have Terry. Uh, Terry, go ahead. Uh, hi, Michael. Um, some comedians sort of have a mission, and some of them. Um, of course, get censored because they have a mission. But I wondered, do you feel you have something that's driving you to do this? And um, if you do, are you finding converts to stoicism? Is that, you know, the driving force of, uh, of what you're doing? Um, <coughs> Thank you. Good question. Uh, I don't know if there's a... I'm not on a mission so much. I know some other comedians are like, look, I, I really want to tell people about whatever their issue is. Um, you know, I want to get the word out about poverty or something. And I've, even I've, I've written a show about poverty in, in, in the past because I was working with like World Vision. Um, but ultimately, I don't think I have a mission. I, there's not something I want to say. It's more... I guess being true to my nature. I love making people laugh. I love telling jokes. I love doing it. Um, I just watched Jerry Seinfeld special and he's on stage. He's like, look, I'm 65. <laughs> I'm a multi-billionaire. I don't need to be out here doing comedy, but he does because he loves doing it. And I'm kind of like that as well. Um, look, except for the billionaire part. Except for the, <laughs> except for the billionaire part. <laughs> not quite there yet but um yeah i uh i love doing it i would do i don't tell don't tell uh people who run gigs this but i would do it even if they didn't pay me uh if i could if i could have enough to live on and you know pay yeah no. gigs, I'd, I'd be out there doing it anyway i talk about stoicism in my comedy because i in, i'm interested in my, in the philosophy and I apply it to my life and it's an interesting topic to do comedy about. Um, if P other people get something out of that and then they become stoics, I mean, that's great. That's a, that's a plus, but it's not what I set out to do. Which yeah, again, I, things beyond yeah. your control. It's a good thing. I'm not <laughs> good thing. I'm not making that uh, my mission to change the world, you know? Right. That's right. Because that is definitely something outside of your control. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, no, I love I love that that idea. In fact, um, I actually saw the same uh, uh, Jerry Seinfeld uh, special that you're you're talking about, and I was struck by that same uh, bit when he said, you know, you, you realize that I I could be anywhere else in the world now. I don't need to be here, and that that's exactly the comment that I've heard from a lot of people who have who are lucky enough uh, to uh, do what they love to do. Uh, you know, several of my colleagues uh, keep telling me that the reason they don't think about retirement is because they don't think about retiring. You know, that they're not worried about what they're going to do in retirement because they're probably going to die, you know, that on the, with the chalk in, in, in their hands, writing on the chalkboard or something like that. And the reason for that is because they love what they're doing, right? And I, th there's comparatively few people that are lucky enough uh, that they have been able to pursue the career, a career that is meaningful to them, that is that is uh, exciting. And yeah, you're right. I, I would do uh, what I do for free, or at least for a minimum wage, so that I could live, you know, reasonably. Um, but don't tell my dean for the same reason. It's like you know, I don't, I don't want him to know that. All right, Michael, it, it has been a pleasure having you. Uh, thank you so much for joining. It's early morning for you, isn't it? Yes, it's not that early. It's seven thirty. Okay, yeah. I've done a I've done a few of these uh, Zoom, Skype, you know, online meetings, and sometimes they're like five o'clock, six o'clock. So again, premeditation of evil. I thought that's right. <laughs> I'd be getting up at four a.m. So I'm delighted. <laughs> well, thank thanks again for for being with us today. This was a lot of fun. All right, uh, 
this is it for today. Um, I'm going to remind you again that the next episode of the Store Nova Conversations is going to be on Sunday, June, uh, July, not June, <laughs> July 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And my guest is going to be uh, university uh, professor of, of philosophy, uh, Rob Coulter. He's at the University of, of uh, Wyoming, and he's, he was the, the, the person who actually established the first Stoic camp uh, that I know of, at least. And also, he has extensive uh, uh, you know, um, practice uh, talking about stoicism to uh, uh, inmates. And that's going to be something that uh, we want to talk about to see how stoicism is actually changing the life of people who have literally very, very little under, under their control. So thanks again for joining me today. And um, stay safe until the pandemic is over or whenever. <laughs> <laughs>